So hello and thank you everyone participating in this third online lecture about historical and contemporary wood carving sculptors and artists. You can find previous lectures on my YouTube channel if you type into the search bar historical and contemporary wood carving. This lecture will be recorded as well and put online. So if you do not want to be on the video, please disable your camera and microphone now. Be sure that the microphone is off during the lecture so we are not disturbed by any background noises. My name is Lara Domeneghetti, a wood carver and builder from Italy, based in Norway and host of these wood carving lectures. With these lectures, friends and fellow practitioners are trying to create a platform for discussion, sharing ideas and presenting themselves and their practice. This time, the lecture will focus on Xavier Mendizabal Vitoriano, I hope it's pronounced right, <laughs> and Sarah Davis, on the process of making a ceremonial giant and the film which documents the process. All of you should have received an additional email from me with the link to the short film. I will include the link below the video for later viewers. Um, I don't want to take too much time from you too now, so we should start right away. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them into the chat or hold them for the Q&A. Thank you all and welcome Shabby and Sarah. Thank you, Lara. Thank you for that amazing uh, introduction. So me and Shabby share a studio in um, South London, Brixton, and we studied together at the City and Guilds of London Art School. So that's how we came to um, collaborate and make this film about Shabby's amazing process of making a giant. And that's what the lecture will focus on. We'll touch upon the film and there'll be a few stills and things like that. But really, we're going to go very in depth into this wonderful piece that you made. <laughs> so, Shabby, could you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, yeah. where you studied? So I grew up in Onyati. Onyati is a little town in the Basque Country. And I've always liked art. I've always been you know, involved in a very artistic area. And so yeah, I studied the conservation, actually, in Bilbao. And then I came here to do the wood carving and a bit to discover more kind of sculpture world and things. And I discovered the gilding, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start sharing the screen because it'll be great to give everyone a few pictures to give context to what we're going to be talking about. So bear with me whilst I get through the technical elements of this. So we have two beautiful images here, and I would like you to tell me a little bit about the history of the giants. What are the events? Okay. What are we talking about today? Okay, so giants were everywhere in the past, like not just in Spain, like um, there are some actually in England. Uh, there's one in Salisbury, really famous, like it's like from the medieval times. And they were, traditionally they were uh, related with the church. So they will be um, in processions and they, will, they were treated like saints. So they had this sacred kind of um, symbolism. So they were really valu valuable and Usually, artists and uh, people that will do altarpieces, they will make giants as well. So it was like a big thing at um, that time. And then nowadays, it's getting a bit more. So in Spain, for example, it's more separated from the church now. So it's more um, like um, folklore and like more for the uh, fiestas, the, you know, the trees. And so they are these big figures, usually representing. Uh, at the beginning, they were like uh, continents. All the continents, but now they can be any any um, you know, kind of people. For example, the ones in my town, the ones that you can see it on the right, they are uh, representing the, the Duchess and the um, Duke of the of the town. So yeah, and the other picture is very nice. You can see this kind of a uh, 19th century uh, beautiful, uh, and you can see that they were done very like you know proper sculptures. Beautiful. So what was it like for you growing up in Onyati and seeing these giants? Well, for me, I've always kind of believed that they were alive, you know, mm. so that's the magic for me. Like you can, because they dance, so they carry it and they, they, they dance by people underneath. And yeah, I always kind of wanted to 
build one and to feel that you know so i when i was a kid you can see that my father was always kind of doing it with this box uh, like milk boxes and things little uh, versions but yeah i would always be playing with it <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you came to make your own giant and this was the start was in about 2019 just before the pandemic really so what was it about the timing what made you think i'm going to make this giant now well it was especially uh, because of our um, course here yeah um, we studied um, a lot of modeling and when i saw the terracotta and i, I remembered that this um, them usually made um, with papier mache, yeah. so they used f first the, they do the all the modeling with the terracotta. So I thought, oh, this is familiar. So maybe I can do now. Mm -hmm. No, now is the time. And then I told you, and you were special for me because you <laughs> you told me you told me like yes, yeah, so of course you can do that. And that was the you know what it mm. pushed me. And yeah, really. so you were able to make that connection between what you researched, what you knew these were made from, yeah. what you'd maybe seen online or seen people doing, and you thought, you know what, I have these skills. That's it. I have these, and you did it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so here you're doing, this is clay here. That's it, yeah. So how did you, how did you build that up? You know, many layers or? Well, I put, I did like a wire structure with yeah. some uh, material inside. So it's not all of it, um, mm. the terracotta, but yeah, it's quite a lot. I think we, just, we bought like two massive bags and mm. yeah. And then I didn't want to do uh, like a, a specific person. Yeah. So I always liked um, a giant that is from Pamplona and it's a king, but it's not a particular king, it's just because uh, I wanted to use a gilding mm. as well. And I wanted to make nice clothes and things. So I, that's why I did this. Mm. And it was nice because I was exploring with it. You know, it wasn't yeah. someone in particular. I think that's the beautiful thing that we'll discover later, just all the skills that came into making this. And so many of them are ones that you acquired either studying in, in Bilbao or at the City and Guilds Art School. And then also collaborating with so many people in Spain yeah. and, and and next you'll see working on the hands, hands. but then also the casting, oh my which God, yeah. was <laughs> a crazy day. So that was us together, wasn't it? What was that experience of casting? Because that was very yeah. <laughs> incredible. I mean, mm. for me, we did some here in mm. at college, but for me, doing such a massive thing, and I'm very happy how it went because yeah. we were so scared because it was our first time, and the only place I saw it was a YouTube. Um, tutorial and it wasn't very clear of mm. how the stages were but you you knew about it and it was very very amazing day I think that day it was a good day <laughs> always always remember that day yeah yeah but that's it so you went through this process of trying to work out exactly how they're made but to some extent you kind of just had to go for it didn't you yes absolutely so for me uh, I think it's very important you know when you have something in your mind you know to mm. to make it as I mean as as, uh, yeah, that's it that's it and i mean it was really nice i think that mm. so you've talked before about the traditional materials and you mentioned papier mache yeah. so here we can see you using the paper so was yeah. that very important to do it traditionally yeah i think well at the beginning nowadays they're done usually with fiberglass so the thing is they lost their um they, they were carried in the past and they were more sophisticated so they were carved as well so usually uh -huh. the head for example the one in, in Salisbury is carved in wood so they were very heavy and now they want to be more practical and they, they do it very very light with fiberglass and so I wanted a balance I didn't want to do fiberglass but not with wood because it will be very easy to I mean they fall down and so it's mm -hmm. very tricky so i used uh, this traditional method that is lovely actually mm. like papier mache and i was worried because for me as well it's the first time I, I i've done this yeah and i didn't know how we, it worked and it came quite well yeah it did so did you have to put something on first because i know plaster is very mm. good at absorbing moisture but mm. what happened before you put the paper down wax i wax. put some wax yeah that's it and well we did it a test a little test remember when well, i did like a little face and <laughs> yeah like a little head and and it worked so it was like let's do it in the big one yeah yeah so. <laughs>
So yeah. this was it afterwards. That was the, the wonderful paper. And then yeah. can you tell us a little bit about what happened yeah. after that? So once I uh, joined, because you know there were three pieces, mm -hmm. so we joined everything with the paper. It was really easy. Well, you can see some fresh there in the corners as well. So it was all um, joined. And then I had uh, several, several layers of gesso. And yeah, it was a lot of sanding, mm -hmm. a lot of sanding. So that's the painting yeah, there. That's it. And actually going back to this one. So yeah. obviously what we don't touch upon in the film is the impact of, you know, obviously going into lockdown, you went to Spain, yeah. the giant had just, the, the face and the hands had just been painted, hadn't yeah, they? That's it. So when you went to Spain and you've been sort of separated from the giant, mm -hmm. what did you work on then? So the thing is, I was worried about the, the structure, especially. Mm -hmm. Because of course the head and the hands, I mean, it was something that I knew how to do it, but the rest, I really wanted some help. So I have that a friend called Aitor Calleja, that uh, he's from Navarra and he works making giants. Mm. He's, uh, he's lives with that. And he recommended me some that he had already like mm. prepared. And we tried different uh, bodies. And at, at the end, we, I was happy with his torso and he helped me um, making it the kind of the mm -hmm. angles and the structure, the wooden structure as well. Mm -hmm. So it was lovely, I mean, this day, <laughs> to see the whole giant. So there's also, the giant comes with quite a lot of accessories. That's it. We have the crown, yeah. we have the orb. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that, because that brought in some different skills, didn't it? That's it. So I was thinking of um, using the skills that in me, you know. So gilding, it's been a very important thing for me. Mm. And um, so it's oil gilded, for example, the crown. And yeah, and the actual crown was done by my father as well. Like they have like a laser cutting uh, machine. So they did all the all that as well. So it's been all kind of mm. homemade. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a family kind of process, yeah. isn't it? So I oh, thought yeah. now it might be nice to just talk a little bit about your professional practice as well yeah because you made this amazing giant mm -hmm. very much a personal project so since you graduated which mm -hmm. was in 2019 yeah. what what have you been working on yeah so we did the wood carving um, course and uh, that's where i discovered gilding because i we didn't did, uh, we didn't do any gilding in uh, spain actually mm -hmm. in conservation and so for me, it was a big surprise because, I mean, I knew what gilding was, but I didn't know there was so many, you mm -hmm. know, um, different, um, you know, things that you can do. So I started working actually in Westminster Hall, doing some carving, but then I moved on to Elizabeth Tower, Big Ben, and I was for three years there, like doing all the oil gilding outside. And yeah, it was very amazing for me because I always wanted to be especially connected with architecture and uh, doing the gilding as well. So, mm. so it was very, that was very, a nice project, very long and very mm. and tricky as well with the wind and all the <laughs> dramas. But yeah, it was really, really nice project, of course. And then the other one is um, the one that I've recently been doing the um, Abbey, the choir. And it's been a very um, um, challenging because it's been water gilding mm. and it's more in it's you have to put all the gesso or yeah. the bowl and it's been more more difficult but very nice with the organ amazing amazing <laughs> experience actually very 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 so nice you've always have you always known you wanted to work in like historic or the heritage world that's it so when i i started with the conservation my idea was to be involved with mm. and to learn as well from you know, from it you know and that's why i was confident with the giant as well yeah. like with the gilding with um the carving everything mm -hmm. so so you knew you didn't have to sort of compromise on anything really that's it <laughs> <laughs> so we touched upon wood carving didn't we? Yeah. so could you talk a little bit more about what you did was it at westminster hall that's it yeah, yeah. well the, the picture on the left is actually the giant's orb oh, so okay. there's an orb yeah. in the hand so i did um uh, with the wood the actual uh floodily is carved in in wood and so that's another skill, you know, that I apply, applied to the giant. I think, you know, it gives more, mm. more things. And the, the hall is this one, yeah, it's like a really amazing, uh, great hall. I mean, it's a really nice um, place to, uh, to learn joinery as well and everything. But we did, um, so there was, you see the shields there? 
So we did some uh, restoration. There were some uh, terrible um, uh, restoration plan. We took the Victorian ones and we put like a new ones, like more. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it was really nice. Yeah, that's very- In Oak, in Oak. Oh, so that is, it's quite like from going straight from studying into working on this really big, like heritage restoration project. What was that like? Well, I mean, for me it was shocking because mm -hmm. uh, especially being in the parliament as yeah. well, no, it was a big, big kind of responsibility for me. I was very mm -hmm. impressed with the with the place, and yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, space. Literally, mm -hmm. really for us as well. That we like food as well, and mm -hmm. very nice. But that's it. I think it's also wonderful then doing the fleur de lis in wood. Like you know, that could have been laser cut as well, or something. You know, but you actually you wanted to make sure yeah. where you could use your own hands. That's wood. it. That's it. That's it. yeah. So for me. Especially that's like mm -hmm. having more things, you know, like more techniques. Yeah, yeah. More I want to just <laughs> finish with the, the beautiful giant in his full form and ask a little bit about what was the reaction of the town and your family. Because obviously, you know, you did this for yourself, mm -hmm. but I suppose it's you never quite knew how people would respond to it. That's it. And that was very uh, surprising for me because at the beginning I thought, I mean, this is something I always wanted and, mm -hmm. and it was very personal. And then when I showed to the family and it was like, they were like, wow, this is amazing. And I am the town, especially. So the TV came, the ra <laughs> radio, like a lot of people. So it's, I mean, for me, it was very emotional mm -hmm. because they feel theirs as well. So the town is now very proud of the giant and they, they're going to show, for example, the 18th of June, it's going to be like the main event. Oh. That was one of my questions. Uh, actually. So, what is next for the giant? Because obviously, the film ends with you dancing in your town with your family, but there's mm -hmm. something happening, isn't there? That's it. So, it's, there's going to be like a big event where the giants, the ones that they've been in at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, are going to be there dancing with him. So, it's going to be like the presentation, let's say. So, that's going to be special for me because, mm -hmm. I mean, at, at the beginning, um, kind of that's what I wanted to join, you know, is for me, because I see them like people, like, well, mm. like creatures that meet, well, you know. Well, yeah, when you're so young, it's, yeah. it's like. So it's to have my being with the, the others, it's mm. really, so it's gonna be like a dance. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so has building this giant taught you anything about yourself? I mean, did you discover things or? Well, I mean, the first thing that you, every time you have something in mind, I think you have to do it. Yes. <laughs> like that's something I learned a lot. And then I learned that I'm happy with different skills as well. Like, I think it's yeah. sometimes it's good to have something like uh, maybe that you like, but then try new things mm. and be confident, you know, because at the beginning, that was my fear. Like I thought, well, I'm not a um, kind of uh, uh, artist. I, well, I, I like a sculptor. Uh, with clay or and then suddenly if you see things and you can do it yeah yeah not to be held back like that's it like thinking i'm not good at mm. that or or drawn you know because it's funny in a way like i suppose if you trained in um wood carving mm. actually it's only a tiny bit of wood carving on it but it's beautiful yeah. that you could then actually think you know what i've done a bit of this i've done a bit of that let's combine it and Absolutely. Something truly Absolutely. And I, in the past, I was confident only with drawing. Mm. And I was not very confident with any sculpture. And that's why I did carving as well. I wanted to go to that kind of, mm. and, you know, I think it's just confidence. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That was all of my questions and all of the slides. Perfect. So, um, yeah, maybe I will hand the floor back to Lara. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much, both of you. What an amazing conversation and contribution to this lecture series. Um, for our current listeners, if you have uh, questions now, please unmute your video on the microphone icon on the bottom left. Uh, I officially open the Q&A for all participants. If I may start uh, with the first question, it's quite difficult to find like now uh, an opening question because you covered so much. Uh, but, uh, Sarah, you were the first invite uh, for the historical and contemporary wood carving lectures. Uh, the work you have shown might be considered for some viewers more relevant for wood carvers as the material you used was wood. 
Uh, and also, if I remember right, in our conversation about the third lecture, we wanted to break a bit loose from the material and show something a bit more different. Uh, I believe that wood carvers today have to embrace uh, their knowledge about material and technique in a much broader sense. And Shabby, you're a perfect example of this. <laughs> Uh, you. You, you covered uh, a little bit about the importance of connecting techniques, uh, but um, what, is, what could be an advice for future wood carvers or um, wood carvers who want, or like people who want to start with a technique like that? So. Yes. Well, for me, it would be nice to get in touch with people. For, for example, with Sarah, she gave me a, a, bit, a lot of uh, confidence like the giant mecca as well i was worried at the beginning of uh, talking with him you know i was thinking oh my god he won't answer me but then um, you know they answer and they give you that kind of just maybe answering that you can do that gave me much more so i think it's just creating that connection with some people and i think here it was really nice the course actually you know as well that i like you make these kind of friends that we are very different but then we have some similarities so we can kind of um, you know change different knowledge and it was that's for me like to make mm. nice connections will be the first thing I would do mm. so you feel even more more confident with, with yeah. what you do. It's that thing of when you you know if you're naturally like dexterous or you have good sort of hand skills and things these it's good to sort of then connect with those other people and actually find that through that kind of hands-on making with someone yes. you learn as well as well you watch yeah. you, i mean incredible and it's just wonderful to kind of not feel limited by what yeah, you do that's it feel like you can be expansive yeah yeah absolutely yeah, and also not limit yourself with just uh, one uh, technique or material. So um, mm. myself as well, I like to like float between like the artistic uh, methods uh, because they feed it into each other. And, yes. um, and you, you just see maybe wood carving from a different uh, as or like angle if you know also how to model so yes, that's it's really it. really fascinating to see also your giant first uh, modeled part so um, I know that depending on the school where you're trained um, uh, modeling is not always part of it so mm. City and Guilds covers that uh, really well yeah and the drawing really a lot mm. of drawing as well yeah. I think that's so much joy. And, a, and a little bit of mold making as well. Which, we did, yeah, 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 yeah everything. Because sure. I think the process of the mold making, in a way we made, we started off with the wood, perhaps like a waste mold, but it didn't then become a waste mold, like, a, you know, having, and the plaster being such a great material to kind of take the paper, as opposed to something like silicon that obviously would have cost so much more as well, but it doesn't absorb liquids in the same way. So the paper could sit in there and then, as it sort of dried, it shrunk away, and it came out quite easily. Very, it, very, yeah. yeah. It was impressive. I was thinking, like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> is it easy? But then I was gonna say as well. I, I like because you mentioned in your lecture that um, we have to see as well, like you were saying, like metal or see, see mm. looking some ob different objects. Imagine if you are a carver as well, mm. looking to metals or yeah. kind of different um, things as well. I think that's very important. Because every material, I think, it gives different things, and I love that kind yeah. of discovering new, new things. Yeah. Ways of thinking about something by looking at different materials. Yes. Yeah. yeah, really important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I again invite everybody to uh, click on the link uh, I've sent you today. Uh, in the video, you um, show also like you, you made a three mode part, is that correct? Um, yes. Yes. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that because I don't know if uh, some of the participants know mm -hmm. more about mold making. Yes, so I think that was your idea, Sarah, <laughs> to make it in three, isn't it? Because they usually do it in two sometimes, mm. but for the ears, yeah, I think it was better to make it in three. That's it. So we did. Yeah, so we did. So front. we started like round the head and down there, and then one slit down the back, just to be sure that we didn't damage the ears in the process of it of it coming off and 
especially if the ears were quite prominent we didn't yeah. like the second you have an undercut things aren't going to come out so um that's yeah. it and that was that was uh acs then the hands were much more trickier yeah because um as you saw i mean it, it's like the Shapes, the shape is yeah. quite tricky and it was quite difficult too because we did it in two and then i discovered once i met my friend they do it um the fingers they do it separately so they do like two individual uh, mm. little molds to uh, all of them and then they join with the central mm. so that's how they do it so i i learned that yeah, as well yeah but that's it like you had to you were going off like youtube videos YouTube, yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. and intuition and, intuition yeah um but it's amazing that actually even just going from that you were able to do it and yeah the hands were a bit stressful but they look fine now yeah you know? yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then another thing i was very scared it was pa the painting because i haven't mm -hmm. painted like but well now i did it as well so <laughs> yeah it's nice when you do something with so many layers mm -hmm. and so many mm -hmm. different skills i think mm -hmm. uh what type of layer uh, or um, paints did you use oil oil paint oh, yeah. yeah so it's also a little bit protected from uh, environmental like uh, that's it yeah. that's it yeah yeah because oh, as i said these giants they they go very often outside and yeah they move a lot a lot so yeah it's important to think of it and yeah how often uh, are they moving out during the year the, so it depends usually every town has their giants so uh, for example the festivities the main day in my town it's now uh, the 18th it's like corpus christi is like a very big catholic um, thing and but then other towns they have it maybe another date but then usually if there's another festival or Christmas or they come out as well. So it's like they are, they are celebrating with yeah. the town, no? like representing. Yeah. In the past, it will be only in procession. So it will be always connected with the church. But now it's just a bit. Well, it's still some areas they have uh, giants in the church and things. But usually it's not now apart from. Mm. from yeah. they, what was the what's the, when did they what the earliest giant? What's the knowledge of sort of these? I mean, they know, like before the medieval times, they know they were representing because, you know, um, like Moises and, well, the Goliath, there were some figures that they were like St. Christopher. Yeah. So there were like some biblical uh, people that they were very tall. So they um, uh, represented, I think, the first ones. So that's why they became giants, yeah. because the saints were represented as being very tall that's it oh that's really interesting that's it and then well you know things how they it, go it and then we know that they represented uh, different continents they mm. started doing, so the oldest there are some beautiful medieval um uh, drawings and that you can see uh, like uh, mm. different and i don't know why is that well maybe it's because i don't know like, wanted to show i don't know yeah. what were people like at that time i don't know <laughs> what they knew and yeah I have uh, here a question from the chat from uh, Sylvia. So uh, she says, thank you so much, Shabby and Sarah, for sharing this project. I really enjoyed watching the video and learning more about the working pro progress and the history behind the giants. Uh, so wonderful to see the figure in action in your town, Shabby. Really an amazing work. Congratulations. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I have a quick quite practical question how exactly are the giants carried in the parades uh, and uh, do they represent historical figures uh, now you discussed it um your king for instance but maybe you can talk about uh, yeah how they car are carried around yeah so usually the ones that so the oldest ones that we have it in spain uh, uh, from the 18th century and they are like 90 kilos i mean they are very heavy so these ones, of, of course, well, nowadays they do a terrible thing that I don't like because they use uh, some wheels and they, they take them out with these wheels. And I mean, it's not very nice, but originally, of course, they will just carry it with no movement, like just simply carry it. But then there was a, a guy in Pamplona that did in the 19th century, I think it was in uh, 1830 or something. He did this giant that they were very light. So he was like the first one that did kind of lighter well they are 60 yeah it's not that light but from 90 he went to 60 and um then they started making dances and like mm. doing more more movements and that's where this tradition came out like from navarre like of dancing it 
So now they are like usually 40, minus 40 kilos. So they are thinking always like of making it more lighter. And yeah, it's just, you take them up. So you have like in the shoulder, yeah. shoulders, you have like, like some leather, leather and you take them up and dance. <laughs> that easy. <laughs> nice. So you've been learning yeah. to dance. I have to, uh, because of course it's really, the balance is quite difficult. And well, I'm, I'm gonna have uh, some friends that they've been doing that this all their life. So they're gonna do it with me because it's really uh, tiring to, carried all the time so because it's quite long the parade is, mm. it gets long and you have to do some balances and it was it's like a big thing so yeah i'm gonna have uh, help but yeah, i think now i'm able a bit more able to yeah <laughs> and uh, the music to it uh, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about that as well because it's an essential part of the parade right yes yes that's it so um well traditionally i think uh, they were um, played gaita, I don't know how you call it. It's like a, a trumpet or yeah, it's like, horn? Yes, kind of. It's a very specific thing from that area, actually. And it's uh, usually there are two, two with this instrument and, and, and one with drums. So it's really, really um, specific for the giants. So this music that was made for them as well, like to go dancing. And so, yeah, it's really um, like a big thing. There's some like a college for it. So yeah, in, in the Basque country and in Spain is very, very, very popular. And I have to say that uh, in the north of France and Belgium, I think there, there's a big tradition of giants as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just and uh, Latin America as well. So there are some places that they, they keep this mm -hmm. tradition as well. And it was nice for me when I came to London, I was working in a uh, mansion house for, was it mansion house? No, Guildhall. Yeah. Guildhall. And I was doing some uh, restoration and I found uh, the giants of London <laughs> <laughs> and they were just next to me. And it was lovely because I didn't know they were there. And they are Gog and Magog, ah. the giants of, of London. And it was so amazing to, to, to see, see them. them. Yeah, no. They were made out of basket weave. Basket weave. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not, not the best quality. They were not very <laughs> nice giants, but I mean, it's nice that the tradition is even yeah, here. Yeah. See, the, the song that was at the end of the film. Yeah. Was that? Because obviously you sent me a bunch of films and I thought that one fit the ending the best. Yes. But is that, do we, does each song have a particular kind of meaning or are they more just general? No, I think there was a very um, intellectual, very nice guy in, in, <laughs> in Estella and he did all of them, like the, the most of them. He was like, the best and that's those songs are the ones that they play everywhere now mm. so it's yeah it's amazing how but they don't have like a well maybe he knows the meaning but <laughs> uh, no it's just yeah wow uh so Sylvia's answering impressive another question <laughs> from her again um may i also ask how much time you spend on the entire working process for your giants that's a good, good idea, question yes, yes. Like, two years i think oh, but yeah. of course it was years, i was but... working it was more we did it in weekends and i wasn't doing constantly mm -hmm. but yeah and but it, for me it was something i didn't want to rush because as i said this has always been like my passion so i wanted to do yeah at your pace yeah get everything kind of right that's it <laughs> so you, you said as well that uh, there are people who do this like full time kind of, or is it like more normal that people would do it like on and off when they have time during their practice like you? Well, the thing is, um, I think when I was uh, young, they were not that popular. I mean, they were carried and danced, but now suddenly, I don't know what year, but from 2010, let's say, um, they got very famous. Like. Now every kid has like a small version, like this one here I have. <laughs> so they have this kind of little uh, giants. And in the past, you will have only some towns that they will have this version. But now all of the giants have a miniature and I'm going to start with uh, mine as well, <laughs> making it. Um, so it's there. So um, now a lot of, so in the past, I think there were, there was like two maximum, two, places you could uh, go and ask for giants 
but now there are like hundreds. <laughs> it's, it's so popular that everyone, so in the past, there would be like two giants, imagine in the town and that's it. But now they make it uh, like smaller, smaller. So kids can start with a small, like a miniature giant. And then when they get older, they get uh, bigger and they can work at the end mm -hmm. when they are 18 or whatever they can go with the They're main, ready. yeah. <laughs> so it's like, they, 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 they're massive. The group of um, people is called Comparsa, the group of people that dance uh, the giants. And you, nowadays they are massive because it's just, everyone mm. wants to be a giant and <laughs> go with the, with the, so yeah, it's, it's really impressive how famous it's now, yeah. And there are songs like YouTube songs with the giants for kids. It's like a ma massive thing, yeah. Yeah, it seems that uh, like um, spread around Europe, um, these uh, including mask traditions, like uh, mm. coming from the Alps with the Krampus. Oh, yeah. uh, it seems that like from the 80s uh, onwards, there was like a growing interest uh, in these traditional uh, festivities. Um, yeah. And uh, like with those masks, uh, the Krampus masks, uh, people do it full time, which is kind of amazing, I believe. Wow, yeah. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good job. Uh, so yeah, I, like I imagine probably then it could be the same also with these giants that like people do it like full time, like painters, carvers, or like people who model and do the casts. It's amazing. Absolutely, it is, it is really, really amazing, amazing. Um, now, I'm just wondering if somebody uh, from the crowd in the participants wants to ask uh, a question. Uh, maybe somebody wants to uh, show their face. Let's see. <laughs> they, they had some time now to, to breathe uh, while we were talking. Let's give them some time. <laughs> <laughs> or even in the chat if you're more confident in the chat oh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, like we said in the first uh, meeting it's quite scary to ask Oof, yeah. scary. I never ask questions I, would love it. I can speak on a Zoom but I can't ask a question <laughs> well apart from just now but you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. uh, by the way how much are these like souvenir giants they're, they're so cute good question I mean these ones um, um, more expensive because they are from it's called uh, marmolina i don't know how we call it in is it like ceramic yeah like some ceramic it's like ceramic so they are heavier and they this maybe they are quite expensive but the ones the the plastic ones they are like 20 pounds mm -hmm. and they are first modeled and then uh, sold like uh, <laughs> in a big quantity that's, that's it yeah <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, uh, they, they remind me a lot about these uh, wooden play dolls that they would sell in my region because it's a uh, wooden modeling tradition. So uh, having these uh, wooden dolls, um, so very beautiful. Uh, maybe another thing that came to my mind, um, like, is it more common to use like uh, fake gold or like real gold, like uh, leaf gold? So for example, my friend, the one, um makes them the mix giants uh, he uses fake one but i used real because mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> i yeah. want to, yeah i said i mean because you know with one book you can do a lot yeah it's not some I mean, people think yeah it. yeah it's like people think like it's crazy i mean gilding of course if you're gilding something massive yeah but this one was yeah yeah and then big ben for me big ben was so because we used so much gold. And that was that, a good lesson in, yeah. yeah. so I thought, well, then one book is nothing now. <laughs> so yeah, it was, but yeah, usually it's fake, yeah. Um, yeah, talking a little bit about your employed uh, work. Um, so in London, uh, are you working um, now to freelance as a woodcarver or guild, or is it still going to be employed? Yes, well, now at the moment I'm gonna go yes, uh, tomorrow to Scotland. So I'm gonna I'm I work with some different companies and yeah, it's restoration work. But um, yeah, they usually have a lot of gilding, and well, the one that I did the wood carving as well. So yeah, they have 
different options. So for now, as I say always, I'm a very kind of moment you person. Like to adapt. Yeah, to so change. that's yeah. it. So I, I'm not thinking like in the long <laughs> future. So for now, let's see how this project goes. Like the one I have in Scotland, it's gonna be a painting. So it's like a mural and we're gonna do some restoration. And it's nice because there's a massive space that is gone. So it's gonna be very creative, recreating all the angels. And so it's something that I'm kind of, um, I can't wait, mm. you know, it's nice. I think it's gonna be a different thing, but yeah. So let's see, let's see. And uh, your practice is mostly historical. So, uh, or have you touched also some contemporary kind of wood carving or gilding projects? No. Very traditional. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I haven't really. Well, the Embassy of America, but that's. Oh. <laughs> no, it was, it was no, no, nothing. But I think that's what, like, what drew me to make the film was like Shabby was doing something so unique with this giant, or very unique to me anyway. And I was like, this is the perfect opportunity to like capture something. And um, yeah, I hope. Because like you learned through YouTube videos, that was mm. also the idea, you know, that yeah. you gain a lot from YouTube, you know, and it's a good it resource, is, it you is, know, yeah. so like if there's someone like me, you know, like a kid, yeah, who that thinks wants... I can make mm. my own giant and, or at least get an idea like, of how, how it's done do it. and yeah. yeah, I think it's good, yeah. good to, yeah. to share these things as well. Mm. Because it was, it was your idea, I mean, for me, I wasn't thinking of any video yeah. and she will put the camera there. And I was, I was like, okay. <laughs> and yeah, lovely, really, really nice. Really nice. Yeah, I'm glad well, it didn't get covered in plaster during the, the mold making. Yes. <laughs> You're also very lucky to share the workshop. So maybe you can actually talk a little bit about that. Uh, we haven't touched that yet. Yeah. Yeah, so we went to, it was in like May, 2019, I think we got it. So I knew just before graduating I knew I wanted a studio to go straight into afterwards because that's yeah. always a really important thing for me. And like, you know, we had studied together. We Absolutely. Were really good and I think that was the time yeah. actually I mentioned to the giant yeah. because it was, uh, we got the um, studio and we started, I remember yeah. with all the plaster and everything yeah. there. That so was, it was the first thing I, I... It was, it was one of the first things you said. You were like, you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yes make the giant yeah but yeah so it was really nice to for me it was really exciting to be involved in it and to do something big and that felt quite elaborate and complicated and um like I'd studied I did like a 10-week filmmaking course so <laughs> in a way it's sort of similar like I had these like simple skills in you know very basic skills of doing a documentary but I was like this is the best opportunity to try and use these skills because that's what storytelling is. It's like an individual doing something interesting or unique or living in an interesting way or, um, yeah, just trying to tell a story that's not often told. So, yeah, yeah, so it is a nice... And we still share the studio, so yeah. three years on. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, really lucky. It makes the entire difference having like somebody who kind of follows your practice, pushes you in different directions and uh, well promotes you, but also like, uh, how can I say, um, is uh, supportive, like oh, yeah. essence with words, whatever, like everything counts. So, Absolutely. Yeah, because uh, I was on my own before yeah. in Greenwich. And it was even depressive, I remember, yeah. to go there. It was like, oh dear, no, Sarah, no, really amazing, really nice. Yeah, it is nice. Like I, if, you know, like we're not always in the studio together, especially if you work during the week and things, but, you know, when we are there together, it's just really nice. And we have the tea and the coffee, you know, <laughs> so, but it just gives you, it puts you in the right frame of mind to like work in an effective way. and you talk and you share ideas and stuff. It, it's share, who you share with, especially after graduating is, yeah. is so important. And, and what you learn, you learn yeah. a lot. Because yeah. being alone in a studio can be good, but it just depends on how you work, 
oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and but it can be quite isolating especially when so many art studios are cold and maybe the light's not always perfect these things that can kind of pull your mood down anyway if you're then alone in the space all the time that can be even worse so if you can find wonderful people to share with then that is a, a bonus definitely yeah, and we have been uh, treated so nicely from city and guilds, always being in this little community. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a bit harsh, but when you finish, uh, you, you, you still search for, for this, uh, um, yeah, for this sharing uh, environment. Um, so I believe uh, we afterwards, we just have to keep it up and uh, continue communicating with each other. And uh, not losing this threat of thought um, so definitely um, I think uh, we can uh, slowly uh, close uh, the meeting here except somebody wants to uh, quick, quickly just uh, use the time and ask a question I can uh, give you another like uh, I mean, it's endless now. I have completed <laughs> <laughs> the Zoom meeting system. Um, let's see if anybody wants to join. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, it, it was really, really lovely to talk with you. And I hope the participants uh, enjoyed it as well, as much as, uh, as I did. Um, and um, for the next uh, lecture, uh, people will uh, hear closer to the date. Uh, please feel free to spread the word and invite other practitioners and craftspeople. The recording of this uh, online meeting will be soon available and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you all and thank you, Sarah and Shabby. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. <laughs>